Scott, Vice President of Programs and Alumni Affairs at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Um, welcome. Uh, it is with great pleasure to introduce this panel discussion, The Lifeblood of the American Economy, The Landscape of Latino Small Businesses. I would like to introduce Elizabeth Placencia Reynoso, a graduate fellow with ties to her home state of Atlanta, Georgia. Elizabeth was born in Jalostitlan, Jalisco, Mexico, and was raised in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. Her inspiration to pursue higher education stems from her mother, a small business owner and devoted mother to three daughters. Her passion for public policy is rooted in her involvement with nonprofits and grassroots organizing during her time as an undergraduate student at Georgia State University. Her formal education at the University of California, Los Angeles, and the University of Tokyo fueled her desire to understand and formulate comprehensive community-centered legislation. Elizabeth views policy as a multi-dimensional problem-solving oriented field of study and labor specialized in public service. Today, she serves her home state of Georgia as a fellow in the United States Senate. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth. Thank you, Caroline. Gracias. Eh, bienvenidos, mi gente. Eh, gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. My name is Elizabeth Placencia Reynoso. I'm a CHCI graduate fellow presented by Meta. I'm the daughter of a Latina small business owner and worked with Latino small business owners in Atlanta, Georgia, as a young professional. And this experience inspired me to discuss today's topic. During this panel, you will hear from a wide range of small business advocates who proactively engage in Latino small business inclusion. Each panelist brings a unique perspective in the world of capital readiness and financial literacy in order to address historical disparities among Latino small business owners. These issues are multidimensional when it pertains to accessing capital, securing loans, and navigating cultural and social barriers. We will hear how key stakeholders play a critical role in policy analysis and implementation. Our hope is to involve elected officials, academic researchers, lending institutions, and other stakeholders in the policymaking process in order to bolster equitable opportunities and ensure a level playing field among the economic engines of the United States. A 2022 State of Latino Entrepreneurship Report from the Stanford Graduate School of Business indicated that Latino-owned employer businesses outperformed white-owned businesses in revenue through annual payroll. And Latino-owned businesses grew by 34%, while white-owned businesses decreased by 7% in terms of revenue. Existing resources continue to remain in place for Latino-owned businesses seeking financial assistance. An example of these financial resources include the use of business credit cards, local bank business loans, personal credit cards, or loan investments from family and friends, and national bank business loans. Today, it didn't ever have programs and policies supporting small businesses. I'm excited to introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Norma Zunega Cardosa from the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. She is the executive director of the Hispanic Business Center. Norma brings over 20 years of leadership experience in the nonprofit field. Hello, everyone. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. This is the last, the last panel, right? So they left the best for last. <laughs> um, Again, I'm Norma Sonia Cardosa. I am the executive director of GHCC Hispanic Business Center. I am from Monterrey, Nuevo León, Mexico. I was, yes, Ahua. <laughs> um, I am very excited to be here. And thank you, Elizabeth, for, um, for the invitation um, and for your, the CHCI team um, to represent Georgia. I think when people think of um, Latino, the Latino population, they don't think of Georgia. They think of California, Texas, New York, right? But um, I'm not sure if you knew that 
according to the census, um, there are 13 states that have more than a million uh, Hispanic residents, and Georgia is on that list. So very excited to to be here. Um, I came here to the United. I was brought here to the United States when I was four years old, um, 37 years ago. I just aged myself. Um, but um, but I was raised in Georgia. Um, Georgia is known for its peaches and hospitality, so I consider myself a Mexican peach. Um, but it's uh, my privilege to to be here. Uh, it's a privilege to to be the lead of the Hispanic Business Center. Um, it. it we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are the business educational arm of the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, and we have been uh, blessed to have an amazing and phenomenal uh, leader, uh, Veronica Maldonado Torres. She's the CEO of, of the chamber and she sends her saludos to all of you. Um, and it, in 2022, we were very uh, fortunate and blessed to receive um, some congressional directed funds. We were actually the first Latino organization in Georgia to ever receive congressional directed funds. So that was very exciting. And then that was 2022. And then we were also able to receive it in 2023. Uh, thanks to the support of um, Georgia Senators, um, Reverend Raphael Warnock and Senator John Ossoff. Um, those funds allowed us to provide um, services that weren't really provided. They were sort of provided very um, on the surface level. Um, but this allowed us to really get in deep and provide um, business consultation, um, a lot mentorship, and really provide services that are really geared to the business owner and their needs and looking at what their needs are. Um, we were also able to receive the, the SBA Community um, Navigator Pilot Program. We were one of the spokes. Um, I don't know if you knew that. Um, the, does everyone know what the PPP loan was? Um, the Latino business owners that applied, 80, according to the McKinsey report, 80% um, of those businesses were denied the PPP loan. So this, the, the SBA community um, pilot, navigator pilot program allowed us to provide the technical assistance, um, allowed us to really kind of hold people's hands and show them um, the type of services and basic financial um, uh, programming. So um, just excited to be here to be able to um, give that insight of um, some of the grassroots and um, the Latino business owner perspective. Thank you, Norma. Thank you. And our second panelist joining us today is Clarinda Landeros. He's, she is the Director of Public Policy for the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. Prior to this role, Clarinda worked for Congress for the U.S. Small Business Committee and Representative Velasquez, where she served as the Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director. Take it on, Ms. Clarinda. Can you hear, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Clarinda Landeros, again, Director of Public Policy at NALCAB. That's the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. We are a nonprofit intermediary and community development financial institution. If you don't know what that is, we are definitely going to get to it later. Um, we, our members, uh, you know, provide services to, to small businesses. They do technical assistance, access to capital. The majority of the people that the NALCAB network serves are low to moderate income um, borrowers and uh, first and second generation immigrants. Um, just to give some context on uh, contextualized for direct service, um, during the COVID pandemic, NALCAP mobilized over 17 million in grants and low interest loans supporting over 600 small businesses and increasing the flow of capital into Lat Latino communities. Under um, the Treasury's rapid response program, NAL NALCAP awarded over 44 million to local nonprofit organizations that primarily serve Latino communities and entrepreneurs. So in, in addition to direct service that, that we provide um, to our members across the country, we also uh, view um, public policy engagement as a tool to you know, boost the economic tra trajectory of Latinos as well. And that means doing, you know, being placed, you know, being with you all and on Capitol Hill and supporting initiatives and legislation that, that support small business development and support minority entrepreneurship. Um, each Congress, NALCAB releases a Latino economic policy agenda 
where we go into you know all different policy areas. It's written for people like you on Capitol Hill um, or people that work with policymakers. And um, you know, today we're talking about small business, but in our Latino economic policy agenda, we talk about transportation, we talk about climate change, we talk about AI. Uh, you name it. So if you're interested in that, uh, it's on our website, or you can get in touch with me or Elizabeth, happy to, um, you know, talk about that, give you as much resources. I think it also it could be a resource for you right now and in, in what you're doing in your offices. If somebody wants to know the Latino impact of, um, uh, I want to say climate change, because that's what people are talking about right now, that's in there. Um, and then what else? Oh, we also talk about macroeconomic policy. Um, okay, yeah, with that, um, I'm looking forward to the discussion and I will turn it over to David. Thank you, Clarinda. Hi, uh, I'm David Ferreira. I am with the Center for Responsible Lending. And uh, over a decade ago, I was with the U.S. Hispanic Chamber, so I'm very happy to see some of my former colleagues, uh, you know, here in the room. Um, I wanted to make sure to, you know, zoom out a little on this conversation uh, because I've, we've had two of the panelists here discussing some of the some of the approaches they've taken either locally approaching community navigator grants or uh, trying to work with SDBDCs or or whichever way. Um, and we've heard about PPP loans. I'd like to move it a little bit, zoom out to talk about the policy issues and why small business issues are civil rights issues for Latinos. Uh, the rate of business formation for Latinos has always been huge, has always been right. You can go to the middle of a town in Minnesota and find a taqueria. You know, that's the first thing we open anywhere, good food and, you know, and, and a bodega where to get some things. But, um, yeah, but generally speaking, what we also saw is that the small business lending market is not very transparent. It's not like sending a mortgage where you know that mortgages are very are securitized, uh, very in a very well structured way. There's a secondary lending market. Everything's pretty well structured, even though it's not perfect. It's definitely a perfect. But in the small business lending market, we don't even know what small business lending looks like for the whole country because that data doesn't exist. And that's what one of the things that we've worked on with our partners here with uh, a NICAP, um, and, uh, and, and, and we were, we were working on a, with a Kaufman Foundation grant to uh, develop comments and file comments on something called section 1071. And that's, you know, you know, the moment that people's going to still throw you a number like this, it starts sounding a little, you know, gloss, glossy eye moment. But uh, Section 1071 is important, even though it sounds really, really, uh, you know, esoteric, um, because it is essentially just a data gathering requirement for lenders across the country uh, to be able to submit that information, just like we do for mortgages under the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act just like we do with a lot of fair lending. So this would allow us to be able to then have that data. And as we saw, we had to fight really hard um, because they fought us really hard to try to reverse the rule and overturn it. And it was because, you know, there's folks in the lending community who, you know, justifiably are nervous that the optics on some of that data are not going to look very good. And we know that, and they know that. Uh, what they're afraid of is the enforcement actions that come after that. But that's the thing, we need that. Because as we saw with the PPP loan program, in fact, the PPP loan program was, if anything, the incentive for so much of the work that we did on 1071, because we finally were able to see through the distribution of the program, the incredible gap that existed in access to the smallest and, uh, and most vulnerable and minority firms out there, because financial institutions primarily serviced those customers that were more important and of scale first. Of course they did, because they were going to generate the biggest fee uh, on the PPP loans with their largest comments. If it's me, if it's my bodega versus Kroger, they're going to deal with Kroger first. 
So that, those are the issues that we have dealt with. We had to do some technical fixes on PPP, and that's part of the reason why we're working on 1071, which we're still fighting because there's another congressional uh, effort now to try to overturn it in the farm bill. They're saying that we shouldn't measure um, the diversity in small business uh, lending data or even, you know, farming data uh, because, you know, there are no Latinos in the rural world. Uh, there are no min the minority folks in the rural world. That's not really that important. And I think that's what we'll find that is very much against the trend we've seen in places like California where so many generations of agricultural workers are now agricultural landowners and, and build the work. Agriculture is an important uh, industry for Latinos. So that's why we would say, you know, we will continue to work this issue. And there's a lot of policy about small business, but generally we don't think about it as civil rights, but it is because that is our ability to be able to enrich ourselves, to build net worth, to build assets. Um, and, uh, and obstacles to that are, a, you know, that are prejudiced or just simply bad in the structure of the uh, systemically unfair uh, rob us of that opportunity for economic growth. Um, and we don't want to be a permanent second class, right? So that's what we have to do. Well, anyway, uh, thank you very much. If I could say one thing uh, you made me think about on PPP, um, and, and that this is a, a civil rights issue, in particular for the Paycheck Protect Protection Program. I don't know how closely you guys are watching this, but um, in the first round, I-10 holders were not eligible. They weren't not not eligible. They're, the system didn't recognize their social security numbers, or their, their, their numbers, identification numbers. So they were denied. They were denied. They weren't able to get... Um, loans like everybody else was, um, and and they have that same access. That's unfair. Yeah. Like it, that's unfair. Uh, it's one thing. I think sometimes we we sort of accept ah, that's just the way it is. And we should be mad. And they fixed it the second time. Um, and oh, but th you know that's not enough. We need to be saying when you know government programs, specifically relief programs, where we know Latino communities are disproportionately impacted, need to have us in mind. Um, and, and, and it definitely is, I'm agreeing with you, it definitely is a civil rights issue. Um, and I just wanted to point out a specific instance. It just, it, just, it, it was so blatant that, that they're not thinking about us um, when, when they're putting policies together. Thank you, Clarinda. And for those of you who don't know, uh, David Ferreira, he is an in-house lobbyist for Center for Responsible Lending, which is a Washington, D.C.-based consumer finance think tank and advocacy group. And he's an accomplished government affairs and legislative policy specialist with over 20 years of expertise in public policy advocacy, among other things. So thank you all um, for your comments and stressing the fact that this is a civil rights issue. And at this point of the program, we're, we will begin the, the Q&A session. So I'll start off by asking the first question to, to Norma. And um, this section elaborates on access to capital. Studies from a recent 2023 Stanford report with the Graduate School of Business of Entrepreneurship indicated that Latino owned businesses had a lower approval rating for national and local bank loans at 39% compared to female white owned businesses at 55%. So my question to Norma is why is it so important to talk about small Latino businesses? That's a great question. And I love, I love, love, love you. You're my people. I love it. I love that we are being unapologetic about this is a civil rights issue for us. Um, I could throw, you know what, I will throw some, some stats at you really quick. Um, why Latino business owners? And one of the things that I think is so important is that we all learn some of these statistics, right? Um, because we need to learn how to change the narrative of our own community, right? So, for starters, uh, we're more than 63 million Latinos in the U.S. That's making up 19% of the population. And we all know that our people were good at reproducing, right? So we're going to grow and we're not going anywhere, right? Um, collective economic contribution of $3.2 trillion, trillion, okay? That's a lot. We consume a lot. Um, nearly 5 million Latina-owned businesses generating over $800 billion in annual revenue. Um, Latinos were entrepreneurial, like we have it in our blood, 
right? I went to Mexico and I, I was just amazed. Um, I went in October. Everywhere, everywhere you saw a, a, a business. So when people come here, they immigrate here, it's just in our nature, very entrepreneurial. We're resilient, we're hardworking, we're smart, right? But I want to take it more personal. Raise your hand if you are a small business owner. All right. Raise your hand if you know a small business owner. A Latino small business owner. All right. Raise your hand if you love a business owner, a small business owner. Right? <laughs> kind of. I mean. And to those people that we love, we want to see them succeed, right? We want to see them thrive. And I think that's one of the characteristics of us as Latino is the familia, right? Sometimes, um, and, and you know, my background is a nonprofit world. I honestly never thought I would be here. I came into the chamber world. Um, when I was doing my master's, I was looking to do research on how do I get Latino business owners to give more to Latino nonprofits. <laughs> that was the reason why I, I, got, I went to the chamber. But the reason why I stayed was when I saw the different statistics. And then when I started working and seeing the people and seeing the need, the gap, but then seeing it in real life that... Latina, so as, as, as um, Liz was saying, you know, just imagine, imagine right now that person that you say that you love, the Latino business owner, imagine them coming to you, you are a, a loan officer, and they're coming to you because they were very excited. They filled out their loan application. They did all of their paperwork. And they're very excited because now they're going to be able to actually hire their first employee. And we know that um, a lot of the um, Stanford uh, reports say that that is when you employ people, that will help you become scaled because only 3% of Latino businesses scale to a million. That was one of those stats that really shook me that, okay, we got to do something about it, right? So imagine that you're, you know, you're the loan officer. Now you have to tell them, no, you're denying their loan to be able to, to scale, to grow. So these are some like the, the real um, things that we see going on. Um, some of the, the stories that I, I, I was sharing with you, we have um, construction workers that have business owners that have been that have had their business for 20 years. Their, their revenue is up in the 20 million or mass, right? But when they go to the bank and try to get a loan, they can't even get a $5,000 loan because a lot of what they're doing is just with cash. So it's a lot of lack of information, a lack of education, a lack of knowing how to navigate our system. Now imagine all everything that we just talked about. Imagine you not knowing the language, not knowing how to speak English. And you as a loan officer not knowing how to speak Spanish and not being able to help that person and tell them, okay, well, you didn't get it this time, but this is what you need to do to fix it, la, la, la. So it's that person is just left in the dark, right? So we have a lot of these situations in all sorts of different businesses. That's why they, it's vital. It is vital um, that we have education. And I always say, you know, we always hear education is power, right? To me, it's, not, it's more than that. I say, no, not education is not power. It's education with action, is power. So be able to have programs that really care about the growth of the Latino community because, guys, it's a win-win. If the Latino small business community, as we're talking about, right, somos un montón, we're not going anywhere, we're very entrepreneurial, right? If we are able to succeed, everyone succeeds, right? everyone. It's going into our economy. So it behooves us that we do something about it, that we are able to create programming that is intentional, that is culturally relevant, that um, includes IQ and EQ. That the person can forget, I mean, you go into business, you get in there, but you really need to know how to first 
you, we talk about on, in, in some of our programming, we have um, our first level. It's called La Jefa League. Um, so we say, si no hay jefa, no hay negocio. Right, so we have to teach our our entrepreneurs and business owners how to be productive, how to be a person, how to be uh, a productive um, citizen. But um, another of the issues that we're having is um, government contracting. So we talk a lot about there's government contracting. There's a lot of money out there. You need to get it, but there's certification that you need to get, and there's so many. Um, red tape that goes along with it. Um, there, we are, there are different certifications available, but we have had all, um, people that get so excited to hear that, okay, there's money, I wanna be part of that. But then once they get to it, they realize that they're not, they can't get it, they're not there yet. So um, it's, it's very important that we all advocate for, for, for this because they're there's millions of dollars out there. And as, as my colleagues um, have mentioned, it is a civil rights issue because this entrepreneurship is a way for wealth building. I, I dream of the day where um, our, our people as a whole can, can start giving their children money and say, here, here's some money that I set aside for you. You can go to college or you can start your own business. And that's like giving, the, right? Don't you guys dream of that day? Um, but we have to be, we have to do um, programming and allow programming that is culturally relevant, that allows our community to understand um, and the information and to be able to use it to have people that will explain it and walk with them and to allow them to, to actually implement it and, and thrive. Well, thank you, Norma, for touching on the importance of access to, to knowledge, but also having an actionable plan because we know knowledge is power, but if we have an action plan behind it is important and making sure that we have um, information that translate to our communities because our, our communities are so colorful and we know that you work with a diverse amount of, of businesses with the chamber. So thank you on elaborating on that. Um, for our next panelist question, um, this section will talk about community development financial institutions. So Clarina, can you elaborate on why community development financial institutions or CDFIs are so important and where are the opportunities and challenges that small Latino-owned businesses are facing with this? Yes, thank you. I also um, want to, she touched on 8A, or she touched on government contracting really quick, um, and, and mentioning it's a civil rights issue. I don't know if, if you saw this or in the news, it was uh, last year, recently, um, a Supreme Court ruled that SBA's 8A program, which helps disadvantaged small entrepreneurs access federal government contracting, um, was unconstitutional because it targeted minority entrepreneurs. So I, I say that because it this is a trend we're seeing um government programs affirmative action is is one also that is you know mbda the minority business development i can go on and on um where they're taking away uh efforts to address historic policies that have traditionally left our communities uh left behind um so it, when government contracting is an issue, yeah, it, it, um, it is, but it's also um, an issue on the federal level that we need to be we need to be knowing about it, fighting fighting it, not being not being scared to say, hey, tar targeting low income isn't a proxy for every for us, you know. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, community development financial institutions, yes, I, I would love to talk about that. Um, we all know that uh, you, that access to you know financial products from traditional banks. Is, is difficult um, for Latino entrepreneurs traditionally. Um, and CDFI, Community Development Financial Institutions, they are financial inter intermediaries with the mission of community development. So um, they are, our primary borrowers are, are people that don't have 
um, you know, maybe the best credit history or have low credit history or, um, or maybe uh, income volatility. Like those are who we lend to. And um, some data on that, yeah, CD, CDFI customers are 85% low income, 58% people of colors. We're embed, CDFIs are embedded in those communities. They, they are experts in um, reaching low wealth markets and, and borrowers that are underserved. And um, you talked about um, technical assistance. That's what CDFIs do. And they not only provide um, uh, loans targeted to the individual borrower, but they also make sure they know they can pay the loan, th that they will be successful. This is to um, help them enter the mainstream financial market. We don't want them to be CDFI customers forever. It's, this is a stepping stone. Um, that's why it, they're important. Um, that's why um, they genuinely are a key resource um, for Latino entrepreneurs, underserved entrepreneurs, um, and uh, and, and they're in the housing space, but mostly in small business um, is where we see it with our members. And did I answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, for our next question, uh, David, if you could discuss on consumer protection for, for small businesses and why, what, what does fair small business lending look like? And can you elaborate on Section 1071 of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act and other existing federal legislation? Thank you. Um, good thing is we gave you a little bit of the preview on 1071 already. So um, I, the, the small business lending marketplace, as we've mentioned, is very opaque. And because it is so opaque, that's, you know, I'm a big believer of Justice Brandeis' old quote, which is, sunshine is the best disinfectant. So um, I like to think that those are the ways that we're going to be able to improve our economic participation in, in the economy, because... Ultimately, not only are we a sizable large portion of the demographic, but also this country is aging. The non-Latino population in this country is aging, and we are the younger workforce. So they may not want many of us right now, but they will eventually because you have countries like the Czech Republic and others paying people to move into their country. Uh, paying immigrants to move into their nations. So eventually at some point, our labor needs and our economic needs will hopefully prevail. And uh, But obviously the demographic issue, we hope, will it, that's also an opportunity, but it's also a risk. It is a risk to becoming uh, permanently locked into a lower wealth situation because one of the biggest things we see about Latino entrepreneurship is that it tends to be based on personal finances. It tends to be a lot of Latino entrepreneurs, the vast majority of Latino entrepreneurs, self-finance their business operations. Um, that whether they were debt equity ready or not, whether they went to a bank or not, I'm not entirely, I can't give you into all the details, but the, what we know is most Latinos piece up and stitch up their business through credit cards and La Troca, you know, that's that's how it goes. So be so. Uh, there's obviously a lot of education that needs to be happened so that our folks know how to be able to uh, uh, attain affordable credit on good terms, and and to be able to do it in a way that they're debt equity ready, so that they can succeed with that loan and grow. Um, and I would say that the reason why it's important that. It, this is important because there is a very big predatory market in the small business lending world. Um, you know, little companies that you've never heard of, world business lenders out of New Jersey, they do 1,200% interest loans to small businesses where they have to put their home uh, as collateral, as an asset. And ultimately, those are loans designed to fail for acquisition of real estate. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that our community is one that needs to catch up very quickly on net worth and assets. And entrepreneurship is our best road and homeownership to get there so that we can build that net worth, so that we can send our kids to college, so that we can uh, retire, and so that we can further invest in growing new business and, uh, and you know, not have to, and especially retire because as I get grayer, I like to think that maybe we don't have 
to all work till we die. So, so thank you. I, I, I guess that's the general sense of this is a very big civil rights issue. And while people don't generally care about small business, they're like, small business, yeah, whatever. There's education, healthcare, that's very exciting, it's sexy. But small business is important because uh, that's our pathway to economic empowerment. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, and I hope this was useful and relevant in some way. Do you want one thing, I always have that one thing. Um, if the uh the transparency issue with small business lending, if that spoke to you, there, there is a bill. Um, Velasquez sponsored it in the House. It's also in the Senate um, by Menendez. Um, the Small Business Financing Disclosure Act, and that would extend federal truth in lending disclosure requirements for small business financing products. Um, so that's out there. Who knows if it'll make it to the floor and actually pass. But um, if anything, it's an exercise in, in, in building support for it. It's always good to have co-sponsors. If you're in an office and now you've heard about the bill, you, you know, you've heard the you know the direct impact that it could have. So I just wanted to plug, you know, that was a really good buildup um, to the actual bill title and number. If you need it again, I'm happy to. Um, HR 4192 and S2021. Thank you. And thank you to David for talking about the power of being uh, ready when it comes to um, capital and also economic empowerment. Um, my next question was, can you uh, and Norma or any of the panelists elaborate on the power of congressionally directed spending funds and how um, that creates uh, a great impact for for programs and program management um, on a local or state level. Oh, absolutely. I can talk about that because, um, as I mentioned, we were very fortunate, very blessed to um, receive that funding twice. And what that allowed us to do is to really think, as I was mentioning, you know, develop culturally relevant programming but it also allowed us to expand. So not to just provide programming in you know, the urban and, sub and suburban areas of Metro Atlanta, but also go into the rural areas and the coastal areas like Tifton and Valdosta as a rural and Savannah, the coastal areas of Georgia, um, where, you know, I always say because um, Stanford also went to Georgia before I joined, joined the, the chamber and they did um, um, some of the research down there in Georgia and they found that Georgia was really behind. So as a Latino community, la business community, they say we're behind the non-Latino, right? Georgia was behind the advanced. So I was like, wow. Um, and it, that, that, that really, um, my, my, my thought. But um, these congressional directed funds, have, they really have allowed us to um, provide that the game changer. The game changer is that one-on-one, -on -one, one -on one consultation. And that's expensive. You know, that's really, it's, I mean, it's expensive when you're trying to find quality consultants and pay them what they're worth. And so it's it's like both ends, right? We want to be able to provide quality programming for our people because they deserve to receive quality programming. Um, but also you want to be able to pay the people that you're bringing what they're worth as well. Um, so really the this uh, the congressional directed funds has allowed us to to really focus and um, we've been able to, develop a business assessment, a business acumen assessment, because many of the programming in other places, what they do is just focusing on your revenue. So what is your revenue? And just that's sort of where they will plug you in where you are in your um, uh, business growth. But what we've really seen is, you know, like I was mentioning, the construction companies that have been, you know, they've been business owners for a long time. Um, but they have no idea what's going on in their finances. They just have a tax person, not even a CPA, and they believe that that's what the, their finance is, right? So what we have focused on is really looking at, at business owners as business acumen and really helping them get to that next level and developing four different levels. And under each of those levels, um, we've been able to provide um, programming that is meets them where they're at, 
Um, and we always say, you, know, you hear that, get you to the next level. But what we really, what that means is what is your next level, right? Do you want to open up another place? Do you want to sell your business? So what is your next level? And really um, create that that journey and the, so the, sort of those steps and, and walk them through. Pero eso cuesta, right? Um, so yeah, but we're 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 very um, very appreciative because those are the type of funds that that are needed. Do I have time to add something? Absolutely. Uh, okay, that's amazing to hear um, how impactful they've been. But what I have to say is that it's not easy. They're not equitably accessible. Um, you know, the, the the guidance on earmarks is, is gives you like a week turnaround time, um, and our organizations that, that we serve are usually small. They don't have somebody that you know. This is their ED doing it, or their or their uh, you know the 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 assistant I to the ED. I sleep in two days. Right. But if you, but you're lucky. Yeah. Uh, the 200 organization that we represent, I you know probably definitely less than 10. Not even us. I mean, <laughs> this is between between these four walls. Um, but I've even said, uh, why aren't we applying for earmarks? Let's you know we have a relationship with. I'm here. Let's do it. And it's just that turnaround time. Yeah. And you know, and and the language of eligibility. Like, gosh, where do I start? There's all these different. You need an expert. Um, and and you know we. But like our members, not all of our members do, and we certainly don't have the capacity to help 200 members access these funds. So um, I'm hopeful that it, the hope there is that maybe in a new Congress they'll have a better system. If you know, um, but I making want to make that note you know, noted that yeah, yeah they're definitely life changing. It sounds like I'm jealous, um, but just not accessible. Yep. Um, I'll jump in for one last ad. Um, I about about 20 million years ago, I used to work for an a member of the Appropriations Committee here in, in the House of Representatives. As you know, Appropriations Committee is the one that does congressionally directed spending. Um, and generally speaking, I think I want to put an emphasis point on what my colleagues here have said, which is they can be very helpful for local and small organizations where small amounts of money uh, can be useful, but also recall that congressionally directed spending is not the solution that we're all searching for because it's so little, so hard to get, and I, uh, when I was at the U.S. Hispanic Chamber, um, again, another when dinosaurs roamed, um, the, it, we got congressionally directed spending. And the and our accounting department hated us because of all the federal accounting requirements that come with it. So just put an asterisk on that. So the reason why I wanted to do an add-on is not to to try to uh, you know keep kicking on congressionally directed funding. It's to say there is so much funding that we need to pursue and we have to fight for. Like just um, just last week, um, a, so just last week, the president announced in Charlotte uh, seven billion. Uh, what I said, seven billion dollar grant to a consortium of organizations just to do clean energy, a uh, clean energy investments, uh, affordability. Uh, 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 carbon capture type work, and that 70, uh, 40 to 70 percent of it needs to be focused on communities of color and low NL and LMI communities. Are you talking about greenhouse gas reduction? Yeah, GHG. Uh, and by the way, we were one of the grantees, so that's why I get to. <laughs> I happen to remember, and it wasn't seven billion; it was six point nine seven billion. But still. Um, it, but the thing is that now, the moment that we were able to get that, we immediately reached out uh, to Patrice Willoughby at NAACP. We immediately reached out to um, to Brent Wilkes and Frankie over at Hispanic Federation, Unidos, everybody, because we, even as a grantee and on the inside, and many of you on the outside are going to have to work to make sure that that equity comes through. Because I hate to say it, um, you know, if you if you trust everybody to take care of you, the whole Easter, yep. you know, <laughs> uh, and for those that don't speak Spanish, is they won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I would like to say that it's not that. It's also the American Recovery Act. Um, it has tons of spending uh, and funding available. Um, the, the SSBCI funding that got put out, small business, uh, the SSBCI funding, which primarily goes out through states, is they put out state what? Small business, state small business credit initiative. And they put out what? Five billion just recently? 
in the in the uh, in the American Reconstruction uh, Plan, uh, the five billion dollars. That's not chunk of change. I know these days everybody throws billion and billion there, billion there. It sounds like nothing, and especially with the Powerball. But it, this is real money. And uh, so that's why we would like to say, please pursue it. And if all of you care about Latino civil rights and Latino economic empowerment, it's on us and our responsibility. Because if you're in this room, it's because you care about representing our community. It's on you to try to make sure that all of us uh, get our fair share of the funding. Thank you. Thank you, David, Clarinda, and Norma. Uh, my next question was uh, regarding artificial intelligence. And earlier we had one of our fellows uh, discuss that. But um, from either a chamber perspective or from other organizational perspectives, how has technology really disrupted um, the, the impact and the scalability of these Latino small businesses when it comes to tech-centric small businesses? On a personal note, I love AI. I love chat GPT. Um, and one of the things that um, we as a chamber, what we have focused on, you know, um, AI isn't new. It's not new. It's it, We think that it's new, maybe chat GPT, it's available to us now, but AI has been you know, here a long time ago. You know, the fact that your phone knows what you're about to say, you know, what you're about to write, sometimes it creeps me out, right? But that is that is AI. Um, there's a lot of examples. And where we have focused is in teaching business owners how to use AI um, for their growth and their advantage in to be more productive and customer service in... Um, being able to automa automa automatize, automatize, oh, automatize, <laughs> um, their flow, their workflow, teaching them how to work smarter, not harder. Um, one of the big things that we're about is teaching business owners to get out of the weeds. And I was telling you that I feel like sometimes I'm still in the weeds is to get out of the weeds and work on your business instead of in your business, because that is what's really going to help you get to that next level and help you grow. Um, so from that end is teaching them the tools of AI um, and teaching them that, okay, I know that there's a lot of very creepy things about AI, um, but, you know, one of the biggest fears is will AI um, eh, take away our jobs? And one of the things that is, it's going to take away the jobs of people who aren't learning how to use AI uh, for their advantage. Um, that's one of the things is to really help them, give them the tools, give them the knowledge on, and it's constantly changing. So we had a program called Revolución Digital, where that was um, digital market, a certification in digital marketing. Uh, originally, it was just, it's in Espanol. It was for the first level, those that are just starting. And Everyone came. I mean, even like high level um, businesses, they came. They all wanted to learn because we all can use digital marketing. So we had a little bit of AI in there. But this year, we're focusing big time of programs specifically just on artificial intelligence. Thank you. A small comment on AI. Yes. Yeah, of course. Because many of you work on public policy and are here because you're starting your careers or already work there. I think all of you are, I want to impress upon you some of the concerns we have from a consumer perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess the way that I would like to think of it is that algorithms are nothing new. Uh, you know, AI is just if 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 A do B is C do D, it's just automated instructions. I like just just a lot of automated instructions put together. That's what AI is. There's it's not some super brilliant computer that's smarter than us. Uh, it's just a whole lot of different functions. So that's why when it comes to um, determining uh, and underwriting credit.
It becomes so important that AI becomes an enhancement tool to determine the creditworthiness of the person, not a means by which to essentially cement whatever institutional prejudice already exists in the market, in the lending marketplace. Uh, because if we saw what already happened with the PPP loan, imagine if we said, well, well, that's how we want to do them all the, uh, uh, for in the future. And that's the AI we want to use. Well, we would say no. And that's what we would like to think. Please consider looking up the Algorithmic Justice League online. They're wonderful people. Um, and please consider working the, the importance of balancing both the very exciting potential that AI it provides us with also the caution to ensure that we do not codify and institutionalize the prejudices that exist in our society um, a, and essentially lock ourselves into that prejudice because then at that point, it's just a black box. It's not a person making a decision. So thank you. And I'm sorry for maybe taking a little too much time. I'm Latino. I speak too much. <laughs> One thing to add on that, um, I would agree that, that teaching, right now, right, right now, AI seems to be like fun. There's the jet, G whatever it's called, <laughs> that G GPT. <laughs> yeah, um, and, uh, but it, I think we're starting, I'm starting to see that there's potential for some real problematic like elections um, and, and targeting of, of predatory loan products, like targeting in their language. Mm -hmm. um, that's more scary than fun. In my, it, from, I think it can do more damage. I know that there's been efforts on the federal level, I think even globally, to put um, a framework for AI. That needs to happen before I can be excited about this. Um, so that just, you know, yeah. Even, I, and I've heard that jet cheap whatever isn't even that good. So I don't know. <laughs> just saying that. Can I do an experiment? Everybody here who has ever written a substantial a substantial research paper, a paper that you've invested substantial amount of work that you believe you've invested yourself in. Raise your hand if you ever written one. Okay, um, do you believe that you own that intellectual property, that that's your intellectual property? Okay, well then somebody else is saying, no, we can just copy it and say it's ours. So I, let's also be mindful that there's all sorts of intellectual property issues, especially the smaller you become, the smaller you are in this country, especially as individuals or businesses, the more that we end up having to fight to preserve and our rights and to defend them. So just consider that. Thank you. Thank you all. And now we will start with our Q&A from the audience. So thank you to our panelists for speaking on these critical issues ranging from CDFIs to congressionally directed spending to consumer protection to, to AI to honing in on um, the civil rights issue that's embedded in Latino small entrepreneurship. Uh, now we welcome questions from the audience. Uh, please feel free to engage with any of the panelists and remember to direct each one of your questions to a specific a specific speaker in the format of a question for the sake of time. Um, hi, my name is Karen Soros Jimenez. I'm a PGF. Um, I was on who did the presentation on AI, so I find all this very fascinating. But I wanted to pose um, a potential problem and just gauge your thoughts on reactions and how small businesses should be prepared to react. Um, so in my office, we're talking a lot about images and art. Um, and what if art is created using AI? Or what if someone you know, makes a piece of art and for some reason uploads it to AI? Does that art then belong to the software and can it be used in training for that software? Or I suppose, what can that person as an individual or a small business do or consider to protect their intellectual property at that point? That's a great question. Oof. Yeah, I'm like that, that, yeah. I guess I can speak on the-, the I'm not an IT lawyer, sorry. Yeah, um, I guess just maybe just our, our personal opinion. Um, one of the the divisions in, at the chamber um, is called CREAR, and it's for um, the creative professional. And that is one of the things that um, is the big fear when it comes to artists, right? Um, and, and and I think anyone who d develops anything and it's it's their it's their work, right? Um, and with, I guess it's it's balancing that the the 
finding a framework, but at the same time on on helping business owners utilizing um, the the good aspect of it in the sense of productivity, in the sense of not the copying, you know, um, that it the 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 part of AI where. Um, like where I was speaking, the automation, and where they don't have to have someone there, but they can tell it, here are my processes of, um, let's say it's an a a HVAC company, right? So here are the prices here. So when you have a chat, bot, you know, when you go into the website and somebody says, I'm here to help you, that's not a real person. That is AI that they have uploaded. So those are some of the, the, the things, but when it comes to art and intellectual property. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, 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 an expert in that area, but that is absolutely something that um, really needs to be discussed and, and, and yeah. finding some policy with it. It's, I mean, I think when we talk about the framework, that's where we're at, right, is answering these, these questions. Yeah. And I think that um, that's what we need to do. We, we need to decide what makes sense, you know, what, what makes sense for our community. Um, Cause that's, that's what's going on in Congress right now is they're putting this framework together and, and this is our opportunity to be at the table. I mean, I, I feel, I think it seems like that um, nobody really is the expert in AI right now, right? So if we came to it early and said, this is what our community needs, this is how to support our artists and our community, um, we'd be ahead of the game. So that that's just what, you know, I'm not answering the question. I'm saying, yeah, let's look into it. The, you know, uh, and anything else that that comes up. I mean, we should we should maybe even do like. Uh, I mean, I'm going to create more work, but like, what what is the um, you know the Latino perspective, Latino entrepreneurial perspective on AI? I mean, mm -hmm. thank you. Other questions? Hi, thank you. My name is Nick Monroy. I'm a public policy fellow. Really appreciate um, the discussion and you know all, all the different um, areas that we covered. Um, I cover small business issues for my congressman um, during my fellowship, and I wanted to ask you know during um, the coronavirus pandemic and COVID nineteen, we saw a ton of attention on small business and on small business legislation and policy. And we're only a few years out, and it, it already seems like it's starting to slip back a little bit and, and go back to the back burner. Um, so, just wanted to posit uh, this question to anybody who has an opinion or some perspective on it. What can we do to keep small business issues at the forefront um, of policy changes so that we can see? Um, you know, this positive change that, that we've been discussing. The, we, I know we can both answer very quickly. Uh, 1071, we mentioned there's the farm bill is going to try to rescind it, even though there was a Congressional Review Act that, uh, that passed the House with a handful of Democrats, and it broke my heart. A couple of those were black and brown. It just killed me. But... But, uh, but we're, we're here. Um, and, and in the Senate, it passed with a couple of members across sides. Uh, but uh, the president vetoed it. And there was no veto proof majority on that Congressional Act resolution. So 1071 survived that. But now the Farm Bill will have to survive it there. That is a big place because 1071, like I mentioned, is already the law that was passed in Dodd-Frank. That was 20 years ago. And it's only now that they were, they've been able to delay the implementation until now. In fact, there was them and a couple of other folks here who sued the CFPB to get them to do the 1071 rulemaking. So now that we finally get our three quarters of the way there, we just have to bring it home to make sure we can do that. Um, and we at least... If you, I'm sure that there's 70 other things we could name right now that are important, but that's one that's top of mind because, like I said, sunshine is the best disinfectant. <laughs> so for the 70, to get to the other 70, <laughs> um, you know, I think I think the, the answer is to to not stop paying attention. Like there, there are a number of bills, like the TILA bill I just mentioned. Um, there's also uh, a community advantage community advantage program SBA. That's a program that targets under underserved entrepreneurs. Entre um, uh, it sunsetted in, in September, and it needs to be reauthorized. And there's a, there's a bill in the Senate. There's a bill in the House. We should be talking about that, uplifting it. Um, the the TILA bill I mentioned. Um, there's lots of bills. I think people sometimes think that you know what is their the legislative viability? Is it going to go anywhere? Probably not. So I know I hear that in the advocate space. Like they're not doing anything in Congress. Why do, why should we engage on this? We can't 
we can't be tired, right? We can't be the tired ones. We have to be watching the bill saying, hey, are you, are you doing anything on the community advantage bill? Are you watching it? Is it good enough? Should, does, is there legislative action needed to support small businesses in the CRA, um, Community Reinvestment Act? Um, we need to be talking about those things because nobody else is going to. Great question. I would have to I 100% agree with you. Um, during the pandemic, I mean, really for the chamber, you you were still with us, right, um, in Georgia during the pandemic, where that really gave us the opportunity to step up. Because for many for many years, I think um, the small business owner, like la gente nuestro, that we were talking about, you know, that we know, um, they were the ones that they, some of them didn't want to approach a chamber. You know, they were like, no, they're only interested in like the corporate or the bigger businesses. They don't care about me. But when the pandemic hit, they all came running. Like, what do I do? And that uh, and those funds really gave us an opportunity to step up and say, OK, we're here. We're here to help you. We're here to um, connect with you. But yes, you're right. There has been sort of like a and I'm going to always advocate for the that small business education because that's really and that game changer what i was talk, telling you guys about where that one-on-one -on -one and okay i've learned this now how do i apply it to my business how how do i get this to implement this and it's not for everybody everyone you know sometimes there's people who want to stay small and that's totally okay right but also if you want i, I always tell them if you want to become a millionaire let's do it you know, we're going to help you, but it's not going to be, it's not like a, you know, one, two, three, you know, there's, there's some work to be done. Um, and we need those type of programs. And I think what I was talking to, talking to you, Elizabeth, about is, and I'm glad that you, you said it, the, the non-sexy work. I, I, no, I think David said it. Yeah, David said the, the, the non-sexy work. It's that, that middle, once you plateau, once you're, you're established, right? You're not in the, at the beginning, right? But you're established, but you need to work on your processes. You need to work on um, the operational stuff. That's the stuff that will help you get those big contracts. All of these different programs that are available and our people aren't getting it. They are not accessing this these type of programs that are available to them because they go to it and they're like, oh no, you don't have your financials. You don't have this. You don't have that. And it's really finding some funding because it isn't. It's the tedious work and that nobody wants to do it. Right? And that nobody wants to do it. But you know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work from both sides. Those who are providing the service and those who are working at it in their business because nobody wants to stop making money right and work on your your strategy and working on how you on your financials but not realizing that that's really what's going to help you make more money i think that funding needs to be focused on that um the non-sexy work right um i think that is where we're going to see a lot of impact as well one, one thing really quick on, on this, this again um if you are uh worried about you know uh the viability of legislation to deal with small business. If that's the reason why you, maybe we think things are going the, on the back burner. Um, something that I would recommend is being creative and supporting uh, other means that would then support small businesses like CDFIs. They're, uh, they're having a moment right now. And so, and, and they, they are, like we talked about, hugely supportive and um, game changing for entrepreneurs and, and in particular underserved minority entrepreneurs. These are the people that we all, that we just said we all love. This is them. Um, that That's one way to, to be, to keep the small business conversation going. Um, and, and with federal funding, they have to, you know, well, they don't have to, but I mean, we're seeing that they may not have to pass a budget every year. They have to, right? It's must-pass legislation, so you look for the small business programs. Look at see how SBA is being funded, or the MBDA, um, you know, or if there's a small business angle in the farm bill, um, or what else is tax? Tax is going to be coming up. There's big small business, um, uh, you know, opportunities in, the, in any tax package that comes up. I think the 2017 tax. Um, uh, the, Section 217 tax incentive? Oh, God, no, not that specific. Um, no, the, the, the Trump era uh, tax incentives are about to expire. Yeah. So there will. Like capital, capital investments? 
those were good. Those were really good. We need to extend them. See? So there's going to be a package for you know, to, to address the tax, tax policy package. So there's an opportunity, right? Um, that would just be my suggestion is make, either, you know, obviously uplift small business issues, community advantage, Section 1071, um, but then uplift small business within things that are moving. We're adding to the alphabet soup of issues. Um, <laughs> I think it's helpful to remember that public policy is interconnected. All issues generally are interconnected. We're talking here about small business, which I, as Latinos and uh, and for the Latino community and in the broader and the broader community, uh, and we we know that uh, our challenges are you know building wealth and net worth, and because we finance so many of our companies out of our pockets. Building up Latino net worth is a big issue. So promoting home ownership is promoting small business. Uh, promoting savings and promoting retirement is promoting small business for Latinos. Uh, anything that helps Latinos, uh, yeah, promote in healthcare is is a small business issue. You know, uh, prior to the um, uh, Affordable Care Act, the rate of premium growth for a for for insurance market for the small group insurance market was in, was out of control. It was a curve that looked like this. Uh, it was almost vertical. And that obviously is a concern because the smaller you are as a business, the less that you can afford to have to pay and pay more than a large business does. So those are all the many things. It, the oh the oh Boy, if we're talking about tax, the child tax credit extension, that has been one of the most important things in our community for as much as that also has been one of the most painfully inadequate. Because as you know, there are some horrible limitations aimed at our community for participating in that program. So there's so many things we can do. So if you don't work small business policy, don't worry. Just work for Latinos and for improving our economic uh, lot in life, and you'll be helping the small business community. We have time for one more question. Okay, uh, thank you so much for being here. So my question is uh, circling back to the know-how, right? Clearly there's a there's know-how required to start a small business. Um, you talked a lot about CDFIs and how that's an institution for knowledge. Um, and you also uh, discussed how, um, how in this country we don't have, uh, let's say robust uh, systems to educate people on how to begin uh, their small business. And so I, I wanna get more insight on that. Like how can we really reach people so that way uh, the Latino community can be uh, stronger when it comes to being a small business owner? You know, one of the biggest statistics um, is that Latinos are the ones that are fastest growing in startups. Latinas are six times more than the national rate. Um, and I struggled a lot with um, when we were developing our programming with exactly what you're saying, like, do we want to help Latinos, like, teach them how to start their business? But what I have learned, what I have seen um, in our community, as what I was saying, that it's in our blood, the entrepreneurial, the issue is not starting because we're going to figure it out de una forma u otra, we're going to figure it out, we're going to start it. The issue is scaling because there's a lot of micro little businesses that have a lot of potential to um, scale, but everything that we talked about, access to capital, da, 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 um, they, they don't have access to that. Um, how to start the right way? Absolutely. And you can look at, um, find your local um, chamber, Latino chamber, they would usually would have or can direct you. Um, but I do agree. And that's something that uh, in Georgia where we're looking at is finding that one, um, one stop shop type of place um, where, but then there's every county is different depending on the industry, what license you get. So there's a little nuances, but um, I guess the basic part of it, that's something that we, we wanna look at as well. 
Um, when I think about your question, I, I think about government programs. I think about policy. I think of um, SBA Prime. That's a pr that's a program specifically to help startups. Um, and, and it is not there's not a capital element. It's just technical assistance. A microloan TA is another one. Technical assistance, you know, one on one. I mean, we're a micro lender. We're micro loan. Uh, SPDCs, although you know, I would say know them, um, know the programs, know um, you know the SBA's resource partners are supposed to do that too, and and know what's good and bad about them. Like SBDCs, for example, um, you know when when I worked um, in. You know, for Velasquez doing small business work, I thought they were amazing. Like, wow, everybody must love these SBDCs. They just do such amazing work. Small business development centers. Yes, small business okay. develop. Yes, sorry, small business development centers. And then when I got out of the bubble with Congress, because it is, um, I learned that they're mostly at college campuses. Yes. They're not actually in the community and accessible. And 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 they exactly even if they are, you know, on the outskirts or in Latino communities, that's not who's working there. Um, and we need to know that to change it, right? And so I, I you know, I throw those out, write them down. Th those are programs that need to be better, um, or that are good, and we have to protect them because they're always on the chopping block. I mean, Prime is always on the chopping chopping block. Um, micro microloan also. Well, that one is just never getting more funding. And it's outdated. I mean, I think the last time it actually got meaningful changes was like you know, 10 years ago or, or more. Um, so they exist and they're so important. They're so important. Um, so we need to, and CDFIs too, right? Supporting CDFIs that do that work. Um, so that's where I went. I went to the programs, knowing them, knowing the providers and supporting them. Mm -hmm. They're finding out what needs to change, how they're not right, how they're not, you know, how they're missing the mark. I think another way to keep talking that, that some of these government programs do that is is not being able to reach the communities, and in their, you know, in their the way that they're comfortable communicating and the language they're comfortable comfortable communicating in, um, and so the organizations that do do that, you know, mission lenders, local um, community development organizations. They need to be given the support. It, it is more technical assistance to an I-10 lender or somebody that you're translating documents for. That's that's more that's more work, and so these organizations need to be supported to do that stuff. Uh, we can't just say, you know, um, yeah, go to them for help. We have to also support the providers. So support the Hispanic Business Center. Oh, I-10 lending, <laughs> I-10 lending, huge. It is legal. It is perfectly legal in this country for a bank to service an individual regardless of their immigration status and to lend to that person regardless of their immigration status as long as they can verify that person's identity because that is the legal requirement verifying a person's identity the so the, please remember and but the problem is that uh, not everybody likes to do it because, you know, from an optic standpoint, you know, we're not very popular these days. Um, so uh, please, um, in, in as much as we can try to socialize and accommodate in our communities without hopefully attracting too much negative attention, is that we need to be able to let folks know that there is no legal impediment for them to be able to lend to our immigrant communities. Two really quick things on that. Um, uh, yeah, I ten. Um, yeah, it's a way to fix that that we thought about is in providing incentives for banks. Um, the data is so. I mean, we talk about Section Ten Seventy One. The data is so limited. What does exist shows that these are not um, bad investments. They pay. They pay back. But we just don't have the data. I mean, we want to be able to go to the banks and say, "Look, these aren't bad investments. Can you, um, you know, invest in loan products that you would feel safe?" working with this community and we just don't have the data. So, you know, section 1071 things, you know, ways to collect more data is the only way I think we're going to be able to convince banks um, that, that this is a, this is a good investment. Um, and then, and then special purpose credit programs, if anybody has heard that, uh, that's a, that, that, you know, that's one of the few things out there. I almost don't even want to say it too loud. I don't want anyone to hear me um, that, uh, that allows us to target and by, by uh, you know, race and ethnicity and is, is isn't uh, and recently, got even more um, support from federal agencies and in the most recent um, community reinvestment rule. That's that's a great tool um, that, that 
directly targets our community. So um, you have the bad on I-10 and lack like, of data and, and banks not wanting to lend to them, but then the a possible solution is teach um, teach financial institutions like CDFIs how to underwrite, how to make, how to package SBDC or small business credit programs. Um, that, that I mean, that's the real work, right? We can complain, um, but we, we have to actually like do something. Thank you, Norma, Clarinda, and, and David, for giving us uh, insights on, on all these topics that are so intersectional. Um, if you could just take one moment to just have like a key takeaway for our audience, for them to take home, um, if we could take uh, one, one minute uh, per panelist to just have like a, a key takeaway um, for our audience to take home. I think for for me, and I, I was writing this down, um, the financial support and helping Hispanic small businesses thrive is not charity. And we need to really, really put that through our mind. The financial support and helping Hispanic small businesses thrive is not charity. It's an investment with an exponential high yield return of investment. And we need to teach that. And we need to tell everyone that helping our, our Latino small business community, is, it's a win-win. It's a nonpartisan issue. I see it that way. Because it, if our Latino commun business community thrives, everyone thrives. Thank you. Clarinda? Uh, I would I would say when it comes to small business, sometimes it feels far away, and and when we're thinking about small business, I mean I'm guessing also you're here, you're probably interested in policy, but you probably or it's a, there's a good chance you have a personal connection to small business. You know a small business owner, you want to be one. Um, maybe you were raised by one. I know you know, I have a sister who owns a hair salon. When when I'm looking at um, small business policy, I'm thinking of her. I'm thinking of a person. Would this help her? What are her challenges? And when I think of that, I think of licensing. Um, I think of translations of documents. I think of uh, the, the not, I don't want to say burden, but the, the high compliance requirements, uh, it, you know, for, for the business. Um, I think of those things. And my takeaway and recommendation would be, don't lose that. When you're looking at things, Think of this, the actual small, think of that person that you know, um, and, and use that lens when you're evaluating everything. Like, would, it, would this help that person? Thank you. David? In 60 seconds, all I could sum up to say is what they said <laughs> and what we've said before. And, uh, and to encourage more than anything, actually, because you're here for, as part of CHCI, is to encourage your involvement in public policy and legislative work in public, and, and because it is, as you can tell, an important issue. And, uh, and I care, and I am not talking about small business here. This is about your participation because you've heard the old phrase, you know, decisions are made by the people that are in the room. So um, we need you in the room. So thank you very much, and have a wonderful, wonderful uh, a summer and fellowship internship process. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists, Norma, Clarinda, and David. Thank you for bringing us together uh, through these policy recommendations focused on equitable opportunities for small Latino owned businesses. And also thank you to our audience for their thought provoking questions. And lastly, thank you to our sponsors and CHCI staff uh, for today's efforts in bringing us together. We hope that you're able to take this information to your workplaces and your communities to build your entrepreneurial acumen in order to advocate for the economic engines of society. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.